Okay, let's watch this video. What is this? Welcome to the DreamHack Download. Everything gaming under one hmm. show. Danny! I'm your host, Vanessa, and I am here this week with Danny Wrench. He is the leading expert in chess streaming and production. He's one of the best chess casters out there, and he's the CCO of chess.com. Danny, what's the best Twitch emote? Oh, man. Wow, I did not see that coming. That is awesome. I, I'm going to have to say the Poggers emote, at least traditionally, it led to Pog Champs. Um, and uh, now it's bouncing around and gets a lot of new faces as, uh, as, as Twitch is using it, so I love that. All right, Pog Champs, that, that's, or yes, Pog Champs event, Poggers. We'll talk about that a little bit later. Let's start this out with who exactly is Danny with what does a CCO of chess.com do? So the CCO, I think, and other other more traditional companies could stand for chief compliance officer, as you said, or even chief content officer, which would probably be the most applicable to my role because I spend our, my time pretty much managing our content. But for a chess company, I, it means chief chess officer, <laughs> which is, allows me to kind of have my hands in everything. It basically means I'm, I'm in charge of kind of steering the chess ship, which is everything from what people have been seeing in regards to our overall strategy to grow the game on Twitch and, and YouTube and all the platforms that aren't actually chess.com, but also mm -hmm. managing the content on chess.com, whether that's our articles Super or serious. videos or making tweaks to our puzzle trainers and all the things people do to try to get better at the game. So I, I uh, get to play with all of it. And that's, that's why I'm at the company is to bring the chess and the content sort of vision. And um, I think that's the quick TLDR of what I do. So, <laughs> uh, well, Chess, we've definitely seen explode in the past year or so. It's just been absolutely huge growth and numbers and excitement and all these new people playing. But let's let's take it back a little more to the beginning because you guys yeah. have definitely had a hand in that growth. So how did you really get started with chess.com and, and how long has this journey been in the making? Really great question, and it's funny. I'm I'm very it's very fresh on the brain reliving this story, partly because of all the success that we've been so fortunate to experience uh, this year. Um, and I would say that from the very beginning, we were always aware of our job was not to just serve the chess community as it currently exists, but figure out ways to broaden the scope, right? And without getting into all the the issues there that have historically existed for chess, and that. You know, it, it's felt inaccessible or, you know, hard to reach, mm, hard mm -hmm. to cross over certain learning curves or just, you know, you sort of maybe sometimes people can appreciate the best in the world, but they see them as sort of intellectually elite in a way that I don't really relate to or all those kind of things that have existed that we've been trying, I think, from the very beginning with the domain name that we were lucky to have, mm -hmm. you know, bringing in so many beginners who just happen to look for chess, we get them first, right? And so it's kind of always been our mission to, to think about how do we keep those users around? How do we engage them? And how do we change the cultural barriers between tournament chess players and, mm -hmm. and people who just want to kind of casually learn? And so as, 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 we, as we kind of pulled the right levers and did that, I would say that my role became much more how do they get like to, describing what a chief chess officer does. How do they get the domain? I mean, I think nobody had it. They just like, I, I don't know. They were just, um, they didn't like, I, no one thought of taking it. It's just bizarre, but yeah, it's just bizarre. I, I would say my job is actually the top of the top of the funnel. And what I mean by that is I think when people think of chess and the growth, they assume that just the domain name or people find us that way. But actually our job and strategy has always been, we want to we wanna remind people or show people who don't even know that they're chess players yet, that they are chess Oh, players. someone had it? Okay. Right? So that's okay. like looking for opportunities to grow. They bought and, it? Okay. You know, on, on, you know, in video game, you know, the video game industry and obviously a value, valuing those communities as gaming enthusiasts who might be reminded or potentially shown that they could also be chess mm. enthusiasts. Uh, also just, you know, digital, you know, content platforms, I guess, fancy words for like, you know, your YouTube and your Facebook, every, mm -hmm. everything has been all about making chess interesting and, and accessible and clickable, I guess, if you will. And, and mostly just because we think that the game itself is already intrinsically so good for people and so fun once you get past that kind of fear, you know, it's, 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 you know, a cognitively very, very beneficial game for kids. It's, it, it's inherently improving critical thinking and, you know, um, consequences of your actions, literally, True. right? And so chess already does all these other great things. So we just need to get more people mm -hmm. in, in past the barrier of, of, hey, I can play chess, right? So a lot of the strategies we've been doing really since 2015 and 2016, I would say, when we really started streaming on Twitch was around 2015, um, were about making the game um, 
understandable, accessible. It's it's in the tone and delivery of how we approach the content. You know, we 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 explain ideas and try to make it edu- edutainment is the name of the game, right? Educationally entertaining, not something mm-hmm. that's just oh my god, chess is hard. But yeah, it's awesome, but it's hard. So um. You know, I, I would say that that's been our major focus for years, and it really hit a big home run when, um, to wrap this up and, and, and keep it as short as possible for you, I'll say that it really hit a home run when we, we launched a format called the Speed Chess Championship, which, unlike mm-hmm. any other chess format before then, it has a basically a shot clock, right? You think of the NFL, you think of soccer, or, you know, football, the Premier League, whatever. Every every sports has a, a clock. <laughs> he thought he was going to say me, like no, of course not. Events, right? And, and chess has never had an element that fans could immediately tune in and understand what's going on beyond the X's and O's. Because you would tune in and be like, oh, this position is super hard. How do I relate to these guys? What are they thinking? Mm-hmm. Now you can tune in and, and you have a match score because people are racing to get the match score and a <laughs> countdown clock that basically is going to decide the winner. And I think what happened with that is we saw a lot of success on Twitch and we actually reached number three and with 36,000 peak viewers back in 2016. That was good enough for number three on Twitch at the time. We did that all on our own and got the attention of kind of mm-hmm. the Twitch brass, basically. And without getting into all the details of an agreement that we struck after that, we essentially started talking. True. And they were like, hey, we love this. We want you to grow. We're like, well, we love Twitch and we want to grow the game. To be clear, you guys, what they're referring to is they're referring to this match between Magnus and myself in the Speed Chess Championship Final in 2016 when there were 36,000 people watching, 36,000 concurrence um, in 2016. So that's the background of what he's talking about was, the, uh, was that match. Game. Let's do this. And so a lot of people, I think, would look at it 2020 and some of the things that happened with, you know, the unfortunate mm-hmm. circumstances of the global pandemic, which did bring a lot of people online. Um, so that was an unfortunate and a, 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 you know, an unfortunate growth opportunity for us, right? Fortunate. And then there was Pog Champs. Then there was the Queen's Gambit. So there was a lot of stuff. But really, the seeds have been planted for a long time mm-hmm. to see kind of what we're seeing now. And chess was has always been almost intimidating for me. I grew up with older brothers who trounced me in it regularly because that seven year age gap really kind of helps. Uh, it's still intimidating player. for me. So just so you know, it's still intimidating. <laughs> yeah. Um, so that I mean that's nice to hear that it's intimidating, but there's a lot of resources out there for it. And now you mentioned well, again, we'll, we'll get to Pog Champs very shortly because this is a very cool thing that you guys are doing, um, but. Queen's Gambit and a pandemic um, have definitely pushed a lot of numbers your way. Mm-hmm. I know that chess boards were sold out for months. No one could get it. What yeah. did you see happen? I'd love to know on your side. Did you see this huge influx of, of players? Did kind of Twitch numbers go up even more with the popularity of Queen's Gambit? Like I assume that was a really huge positive for yeah. you guys. Yes, and yes, and yes. So I... I kind of gave that long answer partly because I wanted to explain what we're going to get into now that it, it did have a history and kind of a, a plan mm-hmm. even though we got lucky right there's no way we stand before, right the like I said it was incredibly unfortunate the on but the online I think content and gaming communities across the board saw massive spikes during COVID um, and so certainly there was a benefit there that um, not just on chess.com but all of the streamers doing their thing and bringing chess content to the world saw the benefits um and then the Queen's Gambit was like, it was it, it was an incredible compounding effect. What I can say mm-hmm. is we went from having very rarely crossed 1 million daily active users in January 2020, meaning we had, we had flirted with that before. We were averaging probably somewhere between 875,000 to 950,000 daily active users. So those are unique people, IP addresses using the site. Then we are now knocking on the door to 6 million daily active users. Nice. And so that's in just over a year between COVID and the Queen's Gambit. We whatever that whatever that looks like, right? So that's crazy when you <laughs> yeah. think that six million, almost six million different people are at some point playing chess on chess.com. And and that's that that doesn't even include the you know the way people are consuming chess, right? Mm-hmm. On YouTube or on Twitch or on all these other platforms. Um, and it also doesn't include the other chess websites. There are there are a lot of great chess websites that have also experienced growth. So the whole global chess community as a whole very is true, yeah. experiencing a crazy, a crazy thing. And 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 so that's but that number I think really puts some context to it. Like yeah. Like sometimes Even I think about that and go, oh my gosh. Even my kids are playing. No, yeah. I, I, I said that regardless of all the numbers, regardless uh, of from what they they were saying from about one million. They were a little they were around one million or just under, and then they went up to like six million instantly. 
from all the numbers and all the crazy stuff we've been fortunate about, I was teasing with Eric, uh, the uh, co-founder and CEO, saying, hey, man, I know we made it because Nash and Warner, my boys, they won't stop playing. Like, mm. they, they're literally coming to me and saying, Dad, like, you got to look at this game report. I won even though I had 15 blunders. And I go, way to go, buddy. Way to go. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> Making chess cool True. just in time to make you relevant to your kids. That's, that's, exactly. that's the perfect <laughs> timeline. Uh, so yep. we've mentioned, you know, Queen's Gambit. We're giving them some credit, but... And we keep teasing it. There's this pog champs thing, which really I think gets a massive amount of credit for reaching gaming audiences. If right. you haven't seen pog champs, you know, for the people watching this video, Danny, lay it out for them. What does that look like? What is this event we keep hinting at? It's it's crazy. So it's obviously the reason I said the the pogger the poggers emote has to come to mind because the pog champs, I guess not. It doesn't really relate directly to it, but in regards to the you know, the, 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 what is the meme culture? It's like an OMG moment. Like, oh my gosh, how awesome is this, right? And so that's kind of describes what Pogchamps has been for the chess world. And I think for a lot of people, it's like, oh my gosh, how awesome is this? Where, you know, what we learned about the demographics of chess, uh, those who engage with chess. And I, I keep wanting to say it that way because sometimes chess traditionally has only applied chess players, but it's not. Now we see people want to watch chess. They, mm -hmm. they enjoy mm -hmm. chess. Very true. There's the Pogchamps kind of brand, which was, look, there's the best in the world at chess, and we do cover the World Chess Championships, and chess.com has put historically most of its investment into, into professionals at the top end of mm -hmm. the game. But PogChamps showed that people don't just want to watch the best players. They want to watch people who blunder just like them, right? And, and part mm -hmm. of the beauty of the game is that, and PogChamps specifically, is you literally never know what's about to happen on camera. And that goes And again, just to add once, once again, you guys, PogChamps, um, since there are a lot of you guys who were here, um, this was an idea that was born out of, out of the communities. I mean, it was born out of our community, born out of XQC's community um, on Twitch. So it was an idea that, that basically Twitch came up with. I mean, it was, it was, it was because of the communities that the idea was born and the whole event was created. So, I mean, honestly, at the end of the day, you know, it, all, all the credit goes to you, chat, for coming up with the idea. It goes as far as you're about to see someone make a blunder that turns the evaluation of the position from here to here and everyone sees it. Oh, my gosh, he just blew the game. But also, you also, in some mm -hmm. ways, with some of the variety streamers we've engaged with, you kind of never know what they're going to do or what they're going to say, right? And I think that the chess world historically, as as we said, has had, has had some some um some disconnects between what that experience is like for a chess player regardless of their strength and how the audience feels about it and i think sometimes when you see someone hang a queen and drop an f-bomb it's funny and it's relatable because you're like oh my gosh that's how it feels when that happens to me right and it's not all just for those viral moments but those viral moments became an organic part of the process mm -hmm. because everyone can relate to it even the best players in the world can relate to it. Mm -hmm. And so I think that the, the the industry saw something that was really interesting where people who are not historically chess players all come together around a it's game true. they love. And it's okay that it's a hard game and it's okay that we all blunder and it's okay that we're not grandmasters at it and we can still have an amazing event that's a ton of fun. And frankly, you know, one of the things that I'm most proud of to wrap it up with is to say that I think we could probably guess, I, I learned to play chess uh, in, mm -hmm. in 1995, 1996, when Searching for Bobby Fischer, the movie, came out. It had Lawrence Fishburne and Ben Kingsley, and it was this inspiring movie. And it was a moment that a lot of my generation who went on to become grandmasters in my generation all relate to. We all say, like, yeah, I remember that movie. Mm -hmm. It was super awesome. It's so cool to think that an event like this, in a year like this, we, you know, we could have inspired a future world chess champion, or the Queen's Gambit could have inspired mm -hmm. a future, you know, women's world champion. You know, and, and that's really cool to think about for the for the future generations of chess mm -hmm. players. Very true. Now, I'm I'm curious, and I'm sure a lot of people watching this this interview have, have probably seen chess before, but for those who haven't, Danny is one of the best casters out there. What does a segment of chess casting sound like? You know, can I can I put you on the spot to give us like a little thirty second clip of of, of what it would sound like to hmm. uh, listen to a chess broadcast of, of a really competitive match, not not Pog Champs. I think we can all imagine okay. uh, XQC <laughs> getting right. Well, I'll do it in, in my style, which would be uh -huh. something that I'm always trying to give the audience something to relate to. So let's assume I'm watching Magnus Carlsen versus Hikaru Nakamura right now, and they're playing in a, you know, in, in a match or a game with very high-level chess going on, a lot at stake, right? So we might say... 
Okay, and one thing to take away from that last move, 95 fans, is that Magnus is putting his knight in the center of the board, which is super critical for controlling all different areas. Of <laughs> can you do king e7? <laughs> they get focused on the edge of the board, but here you see Magnus, even at the highest levels of the game, is centralizing his pieces, developing all of them toward a common goal here on c7. And that's something you can take away for your own games in terms of why you develop your pieces a certain way. I always say you want to develop a plan not just a piece or a move and your pieces and moves should be coordinated together so let's draw let's draw a takeaway from how magnus just approached that critical position uh we know that he might even still be in his preparation but the idea is still very educational for all of us to see how magnus is attacking this sicilian so okay we'll end it there right it, and i guess what i was trying to say is it's hard without a chessboard but what i would say mm -hmm. is rather than me i could have said that same thing like this uh, move 17, knight to b5 is still theory, and these guys are, mm -hmm. are way in their preparation of both, right? And I'm speaking a language where people are like, oh my god, chess mm -hmm. is super hard. Very true. preparing it for 17 to 30 moves. I can't relate to that, right? But rather than focusing Very on true. that aspect, Very you know, true. acknowledging what they've done, but finding a, finding a takeaway that is applicable to your own games, right? Controlling the center, attacking and coordinating toward a common goal, and and then yes, you know, you're, mm -hmm. you're still not, I would, I would argue we're not degrading the... Um, the uh you know the 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 aspects that are super complicated right and deep by acknowledging that it might even still be his prep but it's a super awesome takeaway for all of us to see that, that it's a good point Carlson very good point actually very very well said in this way does that make sense and that's something we do a lot yeah. of them mm -hmm. yeah okay, yeah no sorry, I, I love that no you're yeah it's, it's, i love that because like i said i learned chess when i was little and um but but the the jargon i've i've never picked up i've, I've never you know the, your your second form of casting i never would have been able to get into and this leads me to a question i actually have for our audience that i'd love to see comments from them on is i sort of assumed everyone learned chess as a kid and mm. in in watching these past few years i've realized that's actually not the case uh, True. a lot of people get into it as adults and pick it up so i'd i'd really love to kind of get a survey from our audience about you know when they learned chess or what age they were when they started to pick it up um and for you danny i think i'm gonna wrap things up here and i just want i want to get a shout out from you <laughs> what is something you're really excited that you want people to go check out it can just be chess.com it can be something personal this isn't live no this is not things. live you guys let's uh let's let everyone know something cool they should go do and try and check out well i'm actually gonna uh, uh, on that note and, and and thank you for that I, I would say that people should if they haven't already engaged with the different chess content out there the chess streamers out there i would encourage them to do that and support support our hard-working mm. streaming professionals because they are they're the ones who will do all the endorsing of the cool ways to engage with chess on chess.com whether True. it's solving puzzles or playing really fast games or even just analyzing you know their game report we've had a lot of fun kind of gamifying the learning experience right where people feel every time that there's something that that draws them into wanting to learn their mistakes instead of a feels bad man kind of moment right and and so i think they do a great job of presenting that so i would say you know from everyone from hikaru nakamura to the botez sisters alexandra and andrea Levy Rosman, Gotham Chess is someone, if you just Google Gotham Chess, I, I could continue to go down. There's people that have been doing it for a long time, like just the Chess Channel or the Chess Bras. Um, but there's there are so many amazing chess content providers. I would challenge everyone watching to know that if you if you don't think there's somebody who like speaks your language or is your vibe mm. or is your crowd and also playing and making chess kind of cool and enjoying it, I would challenge you that there probably is and there probably is someone delivering and relating to chess in a way that you could get behind and so so search some of them on True. youtube and twitch and and um and enjoy that would be what i would say awesome well thank you so much for your time danny thank you everyone for uh, watching this episode of the dreamhack download as we said right at the start a little tagline everything gaming under one talk show which means we have all kinds of fun interviews like this one with danny and you're going to find it here on our youtube channel <coughs> and also where you listen to podcasts thanks for joining us everyone and thank you so much for all this awesome insight danny nice nice good stuff um not bad